today. Thank you so much, Frank. And um, hello and hello everyone and, and welcome for those of you in the room. Thanks for attending and welcome for uh, everyone online. My name is Pablo Martinez Amescua, and I am an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology and a core faculty at the Cochlear Center. And it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce today's speaker, who not only is a great colleague and researcher, but is also a great friend, friend of mine, uh, Dr. Alejandro Cabello Lopez. It's a he's a Mexican physician. He got his uh, MD from the National Autonomous University of Mexico in 2015. And after graduating, uh, Alejandro worked for one year and a half doing research at the Occupational Health Research Unit from the Mexican Institute of Social Security in Mexico City. Um, I think that experience uh, inspired him to get his master's degree in public health and epidemiology at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden that he got in 2018. And his thesis focused on the effects of occupational exposure to organic solvents and noise on hearing. And since 2018, Dr. Cabello works as a researcher at the um, uh, Occupational Health Unit where he, where he uh, first got his research experience. So I think that's been a great cycle in his professional life, going back to the, to the unit where he started doing research. And today he's gonna speak about occupational audiology and his experience at this research unit in, in Mexico City. So uh, thank you so much, Alejandro. Welcome, bienvenido. Thank you very much, Pablo. Thank you also, Dr. Franklin, and all the staff from, from the Cochlear Center at John Hopkins for, for this kind invitation to give this, this talk and this introduction. And today's talk, I will focus on what we have been doing because this, this work is not only from one person. This comprises a collective effort from, from many people uh, re regarding uh, the research topics that we, that we have been working. I don't know if you can uh, uh, hear me clearly or if there's any problem with, the, with my screen sharing. I think it looks great. Thank you, okay. Alejandro. Yep. Okay. So, so I will start. And as as my colleague, my Dr. Martinez has has introduced, I'm going to talk about occupation in the in the research unit here in Mexico City, where I have been working for almost eight years since I was a med student. Um, and again, I'm very thankful for the invitation. A brief outline of my presentation. I'm going to give uh, some background of where, where is the place where I, where I work, uh, what are the research topics that we, that we have been working. Next, I will focus on the research areas that we have been um, conducting here in the, in the research unit for many years. And then I will focus on the rationale and the motivation for having uh, the studies on, on audiology and, and the health risk related to work activities. Then I will just share with you some of the main research findings that we have in our studies along the years and give at the, at the end some final considerations about what can be the, the future insights for, for our uh, research tasks. So as I told you who we are, where, where is the place where, I, where I, I work in? It is the Mexican Institute of Social Security, which was established this year, 80 years ago, in 1943. And it was established uh, as, as, uh, as a result of, of the post-war and during the, the, the Civil War um, era, era in which uh, the social welfare and the, so the state was taking care of, of the social welfare of the inhabitants. It is one of the biggest social insurance and welfare institutions in Latin America which provides medical health care and other work-related benefits to approximately 30 million persons in Mexico. In order to be affiliated to this institution, 
uh, a person should be working or the company where the, per the person works should affiliate the person to, to, to have medical healthcare and other work-related benefits such as daycare, uh, daycare facilities, disability pensions related to work disease, to work related diseases, and so on. So the, this, this population that is covered by this, by this institution is not only the workers it's themselves, but also the, the families, the relatives of the workers and first degree relatives mainly. How is it funded? It has a three, three parts of, of funding. One is provided by the workers through the workers' unions, <clears throat> by the Mexican government through the taxes, and there is a contribution from the private sector that employ these people in, 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 in their companies and in their work uh, places. And, and talking about the, the, our research unit, which is placed in Mexico City in this huge hospital, which is one of the biggest hospital centers here in Mexico City. Yeah, we, the, the, it was established in 2005, and it was established aimed to study and evaluate work-related diseases among the population that is affiliated at, at the Institute. Um, we are located in what is called the National Coordination of Occupational Health, and we, we have been working with them together uh, in order to uh, evaluate these work-related diseases among the population, but not only work-related diseases, but the consequences of work and other uh, uh, associated outcomes, such as disability pensions, daycare, and so on. Currently, the, the staff is comprised by Dr. Marcela Tamayo, who is the chief of the unit, my uh, colleague, Dr. Cuauhtémoc Juárez, who has been since the foundation of, of the research unit in 2005 and was my mentor during my social service and throughout my master thesis and myself. And, and I will, will, uh, would like to also mention the former staff that were the people that created and were at the first place in the research unit, which is Dr. Guadalupe Aguilar, which was also my mentor during my years as medical student. Dr. Juarez, Dr. Victor Borja, and Dr. Francisco Sanchez Roman. Uh, well, Pablo has already said something about myself, but uh, uh, I will just give a, a glance of my of my formation. I am a medical degree, as he has said, in Mexico. Then I uh, start working uh, as a research assistant. Well, first I I made a social service in, in research for those who are not very familiar on how the, the med, med school works here in Mexico. After we finish all our credits from the med school, we have to do one year, one calendar year of social service, which is mainly focused for uh, clinical urban and rural uh, facilities, but there is also a possibility to do it in research units. So yeah, I was very lucky to find Dr. Guadalupe Aguilar and Dr. Guadalupe that they, they received me here in the, in the, in the research unit. And basically, my task as a social service student was to uh, conduct field work, uh, to collect some data, uh, start writing some protocols, and and learning how to do that analysis on occupational mm -hmm. health. And so, my experience gave me the possibility to continue my formation in, in public health in, in Sweden. And currently, and as, and as Pablo said, my, my master thesis was focused on the effects of organic solvents and noise on um, hearing profile of workers exposed to these hazards at the workplace. Currently, I'm doing, I'm a student of, of, of epidemiology and clinical research program in, in, in Germany, in Universität Duisburg-Essen. But my topic of, of, of research now is occupational cancer related to asbestos exposure. Uh, and in this regard, which are the research areas that we have been conducting for many years and currently in the Occupational Health Research Unit, mainly as I told you, uh, we, are, we, we have a, a very long cancer uh, research line, which is related to the diseases uh, that are due to exposure to asbestos in working populations. And now we have included also environmentally exposed populations. And we focus on malignant pleural mesothelioma. For those who are not very familiar with this disease, it is extremely lethal. It is a cancer that develops in the envelope 
of the lungs and the survival is very poor. And if it is not detected early, the, the survival, as I told you, is among six to nine months after the diagnosis. So our main focus in this research area is to find and evaluate early biomarkers for early detection of this disease and to change the natural history of the disease, of course. Then regarding the audiology research areas that we have been working, we have focused mainly on exposure of, of three main uh, hazards that can be found in many occupational settings here in Mexico, which are noise, organic solvents, and heavy metals. Um, also kidney diseases, uh, and Dr. Juarez is conducting with, together also with Dr. Tamayo, uh, uh, different studies on craft workers exposed to lead here in Mexico. There are many populations that uh, many of their, their inhabitants are craft workers, that they produce these beautiful ceramics with glaze that are very shiny, but they at some point are exposed to lead uh, as, a, as a physical risk at the workplace. And also the focus on this, of this research area is to, to, to evaluate biomarkers for early detection of an incipient kidney damage. There's another research area of cardiovascular diseases, which is focused on healthcare workers, which are the determinants, the work-related determinants that are affecting cardiovascular uh, risk factors among healthcare workers here in Mexico, and in, especially here in the hospitals from the center where we, we conduct our studies. And together with the the, the research area of audiology, audiology, we also assess how heavy metals and organic solvents affect neurological performance of workers that have been exposed for many years to this type of, of hazards. And also, as you, uh, as uh, the colleagues that are audiologists that are in this, in this talk, you know that the, the, the effects of, of this hazard are not only centered or focused on, on the ear, but also in the uh, central pathways that should be assessed when, 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 a, when a person uh, has hearing problems. And just to give a uh, quick background of what hearing loss is caused by, we have, we have many different risk factors for hearing loss that could appear along a person's life, but we, in, the, in our research unit, we focus on what toxic agents at the workplace could, uh, could affect and at what and which level in the audiology pathway uh, together with noise. Not only noise uh, from the environment or, or related to laser activities, but especially that, the, the one that is present at the workplaces. And to give a motivation and a rationale of why we decided also to start studying this this, this topic is if we see the, the, the record from the last part, the past 10 years of, of occupational diseases, uh, work-related hearing loss is one of the most frequent and most, most diagnosed and reported work-related diseases in the Institute. There has been a steep decrease along the years and after the COVID pandemic, almost all the efforts were uh, targeted to, to, to contain and to tackle the COVID pandemic. But one thing that should be mentioned is, that could be explained this decrease is that when a person or a patient goes to the healthcare facilities and goes to the audiologist or to the neurologist and they present with hearing loss, uh, there is not an active surveillance from the occupational health uh, clinical services uh, seeking for persons that have uh, work-related diseases. So unless the patient or the, the specialist sent these persons to the occupational health uh, clinical services, the disease cannot be detected or associated to the work. So this could be one of the reasons that this steep decrease has, has, uh, has occurred, uh, probably due to an underreporting of these diseases. I know that uh, that also my colleagues here from Occupational Health, they are doing some really good efforts to try to overcome this situation, but still the statistics uh, have shown us that the, the, the reporting of this disease is not, is not as it, it, it should be. 
And therefore, we identified some problems regarding the exposure at the workplace and also um, how these this risks are assessed and how the health effects are evaluated with, with these workers. So first of all, there is a co-exposure to noise and chemical hazards in many job centers, which are, is very frequent in many companies and in many uh, uh, job centers. And this may increase the risk for hearing loss. And one, and one problem that we also have identified is the occupational standards and regulations consider exposures and the related health effects separately. So for example, the, the Mexican norm for organic solvents uh, only consider one uh, threshold limit value, which is considered as safe, but it does not differentiate between or make any difference between if this, this threshold is safe for uh, ear or for neural or for brain or for cardiovascular diseases. It, it is one uh, standard for all the different health effects that could arise from this exposure. <clears throat> and also, when many many of the of the workplaces have joined exposures of these of, of these risks factors, and they are not considered in the in the occupational standards. They are there is one standard for organic solvent, the one standard for noise, one standard for heavy metals, and they don't they do not include each other. <clears throat> As we have seen, hearing loss is still one of the main causes of war-related diseases. And when this is uh, when when a, when a disease is categorized as related to work, it is almost always attributed to noise. So workers that are exposed to organic solvents or other chemicals should be included in hearing conservation programs, not only those who were whose noise exposure has been evaluated. And as I told you. These chemical hazards they have they have an effect at the ear level, but also there is some neurological auditory pathway the level where it should be assessed with more sensitive uh, audiological test, which could improve the hearing evaluation of these of these patients. <clears throat> and what we have been proposing is that not only audiometry or the audiometric studies should be conducted when an evaluation of this person is carried out, or also to include other type of, of tests that also analyze other levels of, of damage that could have these, these patients. So as I told you, we focus our research in three main uh, work-related hazards, which are noise, organic solvents, and heavy metals. These are not the only ones that could affect hearing but these are the ones that we have detected more among the affiliated population at the Institute. And uh, overall, the aim of our studies have been to determine the extent to which these hazards are associated with hearing loss among different populations in diverse working settings. Our studies, as you will see later in the presentation, have focused on populations from, from Mexico City exposed organic solvents at printing presses, at pain manufacturing companies, and heavy metals, especially lead, uh, among craft workers from semi-rural areas in a city called Tlaxcala, which is uh, like 100 miles away from Mexico City. Of course, we are aware that this is not the only focus or research opportunity that we can explore regarding hearing health and these hazards. But at this point, and this is the, the main focus that we have given to our research areas. And for the purpose of doing this research and trying to evaluate as good as possible the hearing profile of uh, the participants, we have equipment and tests, uh, equipment where, where we can perform with, with which we can perform many tests. We have a soundproof chamber where we can conduct uh, audiometry, impanometry distortion products of acoustic emissions and brainstem auditory potentials. This equipment is available for research purposes, but we have the collaboration from audio colleagues, uh, from audiology, and also from neurology and occupational health, that they come with us and propose uh, to, to, to use these, these facilities for, for, clinical, for clinical use. So 
this this is not only for research we are this is for research only but we may, we we propose all the time that it should be considered for at least uh, some clinical assets in here in, in third level hospitals or so on so i will next continue with the main research findings that we have in, in, in the last 10 years that we started this research uh, line of audiology. One of the first studies that was conducted in the research unit was about, uh, among pain manufacturing workers here in Mexico City. In this study, for example, we um, there, um, there, there was uh, there were detected 10 different organic solvents that were used during the production of this of these paints. Uh, even though most of the paints now are water-based, at that time, some of them were also oil-based uh, paints. So uh, 10 different organic solvents were measured in the working environment from this company, and they were all below the uh, threshold limits that are uh, established by the Mexican norms and standards. Also, noise levels were, were measured, um, one of the main fi findings is that although these exposure levels were low below what is considered as risky, our findings suggest uh, some kind of autotoxicity and neurotoxicity. And <clears throat> therefore, we suggest that the inclusion of brainstem auditory potential should be uh, considered uh, for a more comprehensive auditory evaluation at least in these very specific populations where a known uh, risk is detected and, and evaluated and measured. So to, taking a, a look to the, to the results of the audiometric findings that were, that were performing these workers, we can see that there's a huge gap between those who were exposed in the production area of the painting of the paint company compared to the non-exposed workers. These non-exposed workers came from the same uh, company, but in administrative tasks and, and, and activities. And when we took a look to the brain stain evoked potentials, which measures the, the, the time that it takes to conduct the stimuli, we have seen that among the exposed population to these organic solvents, there were longer uh, waves and latency uh, times compared to the non-exposed population. But based on this, uh, we decided to continue working in this line, measuring not only brainstem potentials and uh, audiometry in this, in these workers, but also autoacoustic emissions. As I mentioned, uh, and this is and this was part of my uh, master thesis project, we continue uh, evaluating this exposure at a different job center, which was a printing press, where the organic solvent exposure was at the moment of cleaning the printing rolls. Uh, it is not uh, a commodity for, for the production of books or printing of books, but it is used for cleaning of the printing rolls. But we, we, uh, we realized when we visit this, these workplaces that the workers did not use any personal protective equipment, such as gloves, or, or face mask and the, the uh, air extraction systems were not working properly. Uh, so based on what we have found in this, uh, in this uh, the main results of, of, this, of, of this research is that exposure to organic solvents and noise, which was also measured with a sonometer, were below the recommended exposure limits. Uh, this, these workers, presented with poor hearing thresholds. And in this sense, also our recommendation is to, to consider these workers exposed to organic solvents in, in hearing conservation programs, not only those who are exposed, exposed sorry, to, to noise, but also those who are exposed to organic solvents at the workplace, even though these, these exposure limits were or were within what is permitted by the Mexican standard. Taking a look to the audiometric finding of this of this uh, of this study, we have seen that people that have been working for more years and doing the cleaning of these printing rolls in the company presented with the worst hearing thresholds. There was a, a shift 
uh, especially in the higher frequencies. Then we conducted the regression model and we uh, uh, confirmed that even though the noise levels were below 85 decibels, which is considered as safe according to the Mexican standard, there were uh, between seven and 13 decibels of shift in the hearing thresholds, especially in the in higher frequencies. <clears throat> With respect to left and how this could be affecting hearing profile of of workers that are exposed to this heavy metal. Uh, as I told you, uh, the, the population that we, we, we've been working with uh, is located in a state called Tlaxcala, which is 100 miles away from Mexico City. And these people use lead for the production of ceramics. Um, and with a, in a collaboration that we have with, a, with some colleagues here in a research center, called Simba staff, we explored the possibility that some uh, biomarkers, serum biomarkers could be detected in the bloodstream related to the function of, of hearing function. And according to the evidence and some literature review, pressing and not only one or two serum proteins that could be evaluated uh, together with the hearing function to see if there is a relation, an association between these levels in the bloodstream and the hearing performance of the participants. Uh, there is one uh, proposed mechanism for the circulating levels of this protein, pressing, which is a protein that is uh, related to the electromotility for sensitive hearing. And according to this model, there is some homeostatic regulation where uh, stable and steady level, levels in the bloodstream of this protein could be measured. And when there is a decline, of these uh, of these uh, of these proteins in the bloodstream, it is suggested that there is a damage in the outer hair cells from cochlea. So what we found in our study was an average decrease in these pressing levels per decibel increase in the audiometric measurement that we performed, especially in higher frequencies. But something that we should consider also is the the role that noise could have in this finding, because even though we uh, measure noise in some workplaces and we ask uh, thoroughly if, if the participants were exposed to noise in laser activities or in previous job centers, the, the audiometric pattern that we found resembles that of uh, noise induced hearing loss. So this should be uh, considered for future studies. And in these graphs, we can see in, in the left part of the screen, that the pristine levels were uh, correlated, were negatively correlated with the, an increase in, in the pure tone average of the, of the participants, especially among those people that have greater uh, blood lead levels. In the case of Otolin 1, we did not find any correlation, and this uh, uh, association was corroborated with, with regression modeling that we performed later. Uh, in the same population, we also measure the activity of uh, hair cells uh, through distortion product of acoustic emissions. And uh, increased blood lead levels uh, in the same population of craft workers here in Mexico, we found as the, the main results that increased blood lead levels were associated to elevated through tone hearing thresholds as well as negative changes in the autoacoustic emission amplitude, especially in the higher frequencies from three to eight kilohertz, 8,000 kilohertz. Uh, it is important to mention that blood lead levels uh, represent an acute and recent exposure to lead. A chronic, uh, it is um, in order to evaluate if, if there is an effect of, of lead uh, a chronic effect of, of lead exposure in, 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 uh, in this case, in the hearing profile of participants, there should be another type of uh, exposure assessment. And we are aware of this situation. And also because uh, throughout the life of workers, different tasks are performed, uh, and different tasks are, are performed if they are younger or they are uh, older. So younger participants tend to be more exposed to lead during uh, job duties compared to the older one. But the older ones 
are the ones that have been exposed more chronically to this to this hazard. So this should be taken into account also when we when we see these these results, which is submitted uh, for publication last year, and we are in the second round of revision of this of this of this work. And also, it is important to have a reference population to which we can compare our working populations in our studies. So one of the main um, the, the, the main focus that we have is to determine brainstem auditory bug potential mean latency, latencies uh, from waves and intervals among healthy adults. Otherwise, uh, as far as we know, when we performed and conducted this study, there were no reference values for this brainstem bug potential. So we analyzed what would what could be determined among healthy adults in the, in the, in the population that uh, come to the hospital as blood donors, which by definition should be person with a, a healthy profile. And as we can see from the results, overall males had uh, longer latencies compared to women uh, for both waves and intervals. And also, on average, participants age more or equal to 45 years present with longer and both potential times. So this, this study helped us to establish at some point a reference group for our studies where we could compare uh, workers exposed to, this, to these hazards at the workplace. <laughs> but there was, an, an, uh, there was a finding that uh, took our attention when we were analyzing data as even though this healthy population referred to no exposure of no, to noise, organic solids, or heavy metals in the environment or in the workplace, when we were analyzing the audiometric pattern that these people presented, we, we realized that there was a, the, the, the hearing, the audiometric pattern resembled that of noise in this hearing loss, even though the hearing pattern was considered normal uh, above 25 decibels. And, and taking into account all the information that we gather in the clinical record from the participants, uh, we we ask people how many how how long does it take from going to from their place to their job center, and we saw that people that that took longer than forty minutes from their places to the job center presented with more than three decibel shift at four thousand hertz. In the audiometric uh, in the audiometric measurements, and we are aware also that this noise level and that this could be related to noise uh, exposure due to the to the environment, and this should be assessed, especially because the the, the noise the noise exposure pattern in these populations, it's very peculiar in the sense that it has been it has been recorded in, in other studies that environmental noise is more like this quick, very short and very intense burst of, of energy. For example, when we are waiting for the train in the subway and when the, the doors are closing, there is a, a peak in the, in the sound that is uh, produced by the, by the closing doors or an ambulance or the horns from the cars. So it should be evaluated not only the noise level, or the amount of energy, but also the pattern to which these persons are exposed. But we found this, we, we found this evidence in, in the healthy population that we were uh, studying. And we thought that it could be of, of uh, noteworthy to, to public now. <clears throat> and as I told you, if, if we take a look to, to, four kilo, to four kilohertz in the audiometry, there is a, a downfall and that resembles that of uh, noise in this hearing glass. And if we categorize according to age groups, it, the same pattern is observed. So we uh, assume that this could be related to noise in this hearing glass. And if this younger population uh, is exposed at the workplace to these hazards, then hearing glass could appear earlier in life and all the health consequences and social consequences that it has for individuals. And the society and the society. So finally, I would like to share with you some uh, 
final considerations and research opportunities and impact in public health that could be drawn from these findings. Of course, we know that these unique studies would not, they contribute to, to, to a work of, to, to a body of evidence that should be complemented with further analysis. And in this, in this regard, we also think that it is of the utmost importance to consider and evaluate occupational and environmental hazards in clinical records. We put this emphasis and we emphasize a lot with our colleagues that when clinical records are, are, are registered, uh, this environmental and occupational hazards should be considered. And it is not necessary to do something really specific just to ask the people, where do you live? Where do you work? How long have you been working there? Did you identify any hazards like organic solvents? Do you use lead or are you exposed to noise levels in your workplace? That is enough. That, and this could give a lot of information to, to, to evaluate these, these hazards properly. Also, as I told you, uh, we should promote to, to do and conduct prospective studies to evaluate population with no risk factors for hearing loss, focusing on job tasks and risks. Uh, this this should be this should go in, in hand with surveillance programs where workers that have that have these risks at the workplace and that have been identified by a specialist a hygienist and should be included in this in this prospective surveillance programs. Uh, also, as I as, as we have discussed uh, and. We, we should consider to include complementary tests for a more complete hearing evaluation. Although we know this is uh, difficult, at least for the Mexican context, because uh, usually there is only uh, equipment for performing audiometries and not other tests that could be compl uh, more complementary in, in, in evaluating hearing profile of the, of the participants and the patients. But there is also a possibility to, uh, to, to, to take another uh, or, or use another tools that are now more widespread, such as these algorithm, algorithms for, for diagnosis. And we have a collaboration with, uh, with a group of colleagues from Guadalajara here in Mexico. That the, with the data from the brain stem evoked potential that we have gathered in our studies, they are developing an algorithm. Of course, we need to gather more data to run this algorithm to detect what is considered normal for brain stem evoked potentials. And that this algorithm is able to differentiate between what is normal or considered normal and uh, abnormal or, or affected by, by these uh, hazards at workplace. Also, research should be targeted to evaluate the impact of hearing loss, not only among workers, but also among pensioners, elderly people, because many people that, uh, uh, that have been exposed to these risk factors, they don't get sick when they are uh, working or during their working life, but at the end of the working life or when they are retired. So we should all also focus on these populations and not only to determine the extent to which these hazards are affecting the hearing profile of participants. Also focus on other topics such as well-being, uh, the, the effects in isolation, mortality, healthcare costs, and so on. And finally, the, this evidence and more evidence uh, should be uh, or should guide policies aimed to modify or update the occupational standards and the clinical guide, guidelines together with surveillance among workers exposed to these hazards as part of hearing conservation programs. And, and this, is, this should also be like a call for attention to other uh, um, health professionals, not only physicians or nurses, also health promoters uh, that, that could identify these hazards and, 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 and help and aid to to prevent these diseases among working populations. And uh, I would like to acknowledge all of the persons that have been working in this research unit and in these protocols that we have been running for many years. And recently we have also, uh, thanks to Pablo and all the people from, 
the cochlear center. We, we have set a collaboration with uh, Dr. Laura Coco. Thank you also to Jonathan, Sven, and Pablo. But uh, this, this uh, studies uh, could have not been conducted if, if it not was by uh, thanks to the, the work of many, many people that uh, are very enthusiastic on research. And of course, uh, our, our main focus is on occupational health. And we also thank workers that agreed to participate in our study. Uh, and because um, they, they have some health problems related to workplace. And if, if anything that we can do to improve the situation is very welcome. And we are very, very thankful for, for their participation. And uh, this is, I think there's another side. Uh, this is part of the staff that have been working in, with us. And there are many others that I could not find a picture to put in one slide, but uh, <laughs> just thanks to them all. all <laughs> thank all. Uh, I want to thank them all. And if they're watching this, say hi also. <laughs> um, and that's uh, that's everything that I wanted to share with you. And, I really appreciate and uh, thank you for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandro. That was a really, really interesting talk, very different um, from what we've heard in other seminars. And, and for me, very new to hear about all these occupational hazards. So thank you for that. I know there are a couple of questions in the chat, but um, maybe Mindy, are there questions in the room that we want to address first? I think we can start with the online questions. Sounds good. Um, so we have a question about um, when you were showing us some of your findings, um, if you were trying to determine autotoxicity, why didn't you test in the extended high frequencies that go, you know, beyond the eight uh, kilohertz, like uh, they're saying nine to 20 uh, kilohertz? Was, was that a, a available for you? Uh, or I think, I think they are available, but we did not perform them. Or at least in the in the study from the printing press workers, we stopped at eight uh, eight thousand hertz. But I I think with the with the paint manufacturing workers, uh, it, it was extended until until sixteen. But we, we did it in the, at, at that time uh, it was not considered to 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 be included in the in the final in, in the final analysis. But that, that we, we should consider them uh, uh, because uh, these frequencies are the ones that are more effective uh, due to the exposure to organic solvents. Thank you, Alejandro. There, there is another question. Uh, would you expand on what additional diagnostic information the ABR provides? And I'm at least I'm not familiar with AVR, so if I don't know what abbreviation. Oh, auditory brain response. Thank you, John. Um, Thanks. Also, could you compare the AVRs of exposed workers to previously collected AVR norms? Yeah, that's a good question. We are not as as uh, we are not very familiar as as an epidemiologist with. With, with the role of these tests, uh, we have consulted with some audiologists here, and uh, it is difficult to establish like a standard. For example, for audiometric findings, it is well established that below, uh, no, above 25 decibels, it is considered hearing loss, and there's different degrees of of damage that could be that could be measured with these tests. But with brainstem above potentials, there is no such standard. And what we have done is to compare the healthy population brainstem responses with the ones 
uh, from these working settings. And what we have found, even though we, we, we have not uh, published this, this data yet, is that there are some differences. It took long, it takes longer for the stimuli to be recorded in this, in this population exposed to organic solvents. But we are also aware that also the morphology of these of these waves and the intervals should be considered, uh, like trying to extrapolate what happens with the uh, EKG. We not only consider the time between the the different waves and and intervals. We also consider the morphology, and this is something that we want to explore further for research purposes. And if it is useful, also for clinical for clinical evaluations. Thank you. Um, there is another question for you, um, John. Is saying, great presentation. When you mentioned uh, diverse work settings, I'm curious if you considered different exposures among works and whether this was controlled for. For example, I would imagine that workers exposed to lead have a different risk profile than workers exposed to occupational noise. Thank you. In terms of probably the other exposed uh, hazards that they are exposed to in their jobs. I, I think that's what John is referring to. Yes, that's a really good question because, well, thank you, John, for your, <laughs> for your comment. And uh, it is quite difficult to, to characterize properly the exposure to, to, to these uh, work-related hazards. Uh, there are many different um, forms, for example, job matrix uh, that have been used, uh, but they tend to misclassify the exposure of, of these of this, uh, participants. Uh, when, when I refer on diverse working settings, it's something that we have, uh, uh, we, have we have come up with this idea by talking to the people directly. Uh, at, at first, we assumed that people that, for example, the ones that produce ceramics were most, mostly exposed to lead when they use paint or they put the glaze to, to make it shiny. But we realized when we were asked more thoroughly uh, among this population that the greatest exposure to lead is when they burn uh, some trash that they find like uh, some, some kind of uh, uh, metals uh, and trash, trash cans and so on to, to get the lead from these sources. And when they burn it and melt the, the lead, there is a lot of particles that are spread into the environment. And there, that is the, the main exposure to lead. And of course, as Jonathan says and, and points out, the the the, prof, the the risk profile for hearing loss is very different among this this population and the ones that are exposed to noise, and also in Mexico and, and particularly in this in this population, people tend to change a lot from one job center to another, and it is very different the exposure profile. For example, some of them have been working in fact in, in car factories or paint factories or places where noise levels are above 85 decibels. And when we want to, to, to record this, there might be some recall bias from the exposure. It's, 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 it's extremely difficult to accurately assess this exposure pattern, but we should consider, and we have considered the, these, these issues when we assign exposure and when we also control for this for these variables in our analysis. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, there is one other comment in the chat from uh, Michelle Arnold, and she's thanking you for your talk. And she says there, uh, her yes. and her colleagues recently conducted similar analysis using data from the um, SOL study, study of Latinos, looking at occupational type, occupation type, autotoxic auto agent exposure, workplace noise, CBD risk, age, and hearing protection use at work, and some other factors. And um, she, I'm, I'm going to share her, her whole message with you because she's, uh, you know, saying that maybe she would appreciate an opportunity to discuss with you. Yeah, and sure. 
opportunity, they found that occupation type was more strongly associated with hearing loss than Sorry. noise or other toxic exposure. So that would be, you know, some that's, I think that's very intriguing. Uh, thank you yeah. for your comment. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I do have another question for myself, but I'd like to give opportunity to others in the room or the chat to say something, if if there are questions. Thanks, Pablo. Uh, any questions from the audience? Um, Alejandro, I, I have one actually, that was, that was a wonderful talk, this is Frank. Um, and it's a wonderful talk because I think so often here we, at least as a center, we, we think about hearing loss as being the exposure and then we think about some of their outcomes, right? Whereas That's it's right. very refreshing to get an occupational health perspective on this where hearing is obviously clear the outcome and different exposures. So one thing I'll be, I'll be honest, I'm a little embarrassed to say I did not realize, and you, you had a couple of slides, so I was hoping you could talk about a little more if you, if you know more about it. The idea of Preston being a, a serum biomarker of potential ototoxic uh, damage. And you showed a, a summary slide, I mean, if you can pull up, that'd be great if you don't have to though, showing like, um, here's saying higher PTA associated being with greater levels of Preston being found in the serum. Could you talk a little more about that? I wasn't sure, it's my own personal ignorance of how robust the literature is as Preston being a serum biomarker of ototoxicity and does that offer new opportunities for either occupational hearing screening or health screening to look at uh, damage per se or, or many other instances where you, you, a biomarker would be very, very powerful to uh, predict a lot of things and or to guide therapeutics. Thanks, Dr. Franklin, for the question. Yes, I just said, uh, and for example, when I took a look to the to the work that Pablo has done with you, and you use hearing loss as uh, the main exposure for uh, other outcomes, uh, which is also great. And it, this is some research opportunity that we also want to explore. And uh, regarding these <clears throat> these proteins, we were looking at the literature and and see that Preston, for example, is. Uh, it could be analyzed more related to noise-related hearing loss. Um, according to the evidence that I have read uh, in this in this matter, there is there is uh, there is like a steady, stable level of uh, of resting in the bloodstream that could be measured because there is some some sort of homeostatic regulation that recycles the resting that is released from the outer hair cells and. It, uh, and according to this to this evidence, it is assumed when the, these levels that should be prospectively followed and measured, when they present a downfall, it sh it should uh, suggest us that there is a, a damage at the outer hair cell uh, hair, outer hair cells level. So uh, this should be corroborated also with autoacoustic emissions. That's what I think, and also. I would like to comment with the colleagues that are audiologists from the audience, because that's one very specific test that could aid to relate these, these, these findings. Uh, what we have discussed with also with our colleagues that have performed this analysis is that the protein is quite stable to be measured in the bloodstream. But first we need an initial measurement of this of this protein in order to see if there is have been changes in the hearing in the hearing profile and the hearing behavior of the person if the person itself had he or he, her or himself had detected uh, some sort of hearing loss or the self uh, perception of hearing loss and also to corroborate this with the with the measurements in the bloodstream so uh, and also the the technique to to perform the analysis is an ELISA test it is quite widespread also in many second and third level hospitals, at least here in Mexico. So probably it could be one, one good option or a good alternative to, to, to consider for future studies and see if it is available for, not only for research purposes, but also for clinical use at some point. I know it is quite difficult to, to achieve this. It takes a long time and a lot of studies to confirm this. But apparently the, the results are quite promising in this regard. Thank you. Uh, I know we're uh, running out of time, uh, but I'd like to ask you one question. Um, you've mentioned that it's a challenge for this population and for your for the institute to identify people with hearing loss and attribute that hearing loss 
to occupational hazards. Uh, can you say whether there's a difference for the Institute in terms of treatment available or you know, early retirement pensions when the hearing loss is attributed to occupation versus not? Yeah, that's a really good question, Pablo, because it has more, in terms of the treatment or the diagnosis, it does, does not have any, any effect. But if the, if the disease is considered or related to work, or as, a, as it is called, a general disease, uh, the, the possibility to get a disability pension uh, from the Institute changes a lot. So when, when, when you get a disability pension from a general disease, the amount of money that the person receives is less, quite less compared to if the, if the disease is considered related to work. Uh, I'm not an, uh, uh, an occupational physician, but what we have learned from our colleagues here in occupational health is that uh, if, if the hearing loss or any other disease is considered as work-related, the, the disability pension is higher compared to the people that uh, whose, whose disease is considered as general or where there is no uh, reason to consider it related to work. And also this, this uh, it's, ex it's not extremely difficult, but it takes longer to find this yeah. so-called causal yeah. relation between, between the exposure at the workplace and the health effect that uh, that the person receives the pension for. Thank you. There's, I, a, there's a difference in, in the amount. I, th I think that's there. a huge implication of the work that you are doing and leading can have not only preventive you know, implications, but also tertiary prevention implications. Uh, so uh, we're, it's uh, one, it's yeah, after 1 p.m., so I, I, I'd like to thank you again, Alejandro. It was wonderful to have you. And I know there's going to be a Q&A for trainees uh, later on, I think in, in one hour. So um, have fun. And thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Pablo, and everybody in that attended this, this session. It was uh, I'm extremely happy to be, to be here. <laughs> wonderful.